We go now to Kentucky Republican Senator Rand Paul, whose objection to this week's funding agreement touched off an ever so brief government shutdown. Senator Paul joins us from Palm Beach, Florida. Senator, what did you accomplish? Well, you know, I think we should draw attention to the fact that we're spending so much money. I ran for office in 2010 with what was called sort of the Tea Party tidal wave at that point. And we were very, very critical of President Obama's uh, deficits, you know, approaching a trillion dollars in a year. We talked endlessly about them. We had 100,000 people rally on the mall in Washington. And I'm still against deficit spending. Just because Republicans are doing it doesn't make it any better. And now we have deficits projected to be a trillion dollars again, and yet in a growing non-recessionary economy. Are you troubled by that? Yeah, I'm very worried. And I think uh, one of the questions, see, Republicans, I think, are not willing to ask themselves is, can you be fiscally conservative and be for unlimited military spending? There's sort of this question, is the military budget too small or maybe is our mission too large around the world? And because Republicans are unwilling to confront that, they want, you know, more, more, more for military spending. And so to get that, they have to give the Democrats what they want, which is more, more, more for domestic spending. And the compromise, while some are happy, oh, it's bipartisanship. Well, if the bipartisanship is exploding the deficit, I'm not so sure that's the kind of bipartisanship we need. From your point of view, Senator, on the defense side of the equation, is the spending and the mission, are they reckless? I think the mission is, is beyond what we need to be. We're actively in war in about seven countries, and yet the Congress hasn't voted on uh, declaring or authorizing the use of military force in over 15 years now. So I've been one that's been bugging the Senate and Congress to say, how can we be at war without ever voting on it? Don't the American people, through their representatives, get a chance to say when we go to war? I think the Afghan war is long past uh, its mission. I think we killed and captured and disrupted the people who attacked us on 9-11 long ago. And I think now it's a nation building exercise. We're spending $50 billion a year. And if the president really is serious about infrastructure, a lot of that money could be spent at home instead of building bridges and schools and roads in Afghanistan or in Pakistan. I think we could do that at home. And the interesting thing is I think the president's instincts lean that way. Um, but his but, policies uh, have not. Got, his policies have not, though. Yeah. And that's the sort of the problem. And this is something that we've seen even going back to Reagan. Conservatives said, they, oh, we love Reagan. But then the people appointed around him were often big government types. That's a little bit of the problem I see here is that I think Donald Trump is probably the least interventionist minded president we've had in a long time. I mean, he criticized George Bush for the intervention in the Iraq war. I think he's not that excited about continuing the Afghan war forever. But the generals he surrounded him with don't want to admit that there isn't a military solution. And so the war goes on and on and on. And really, I think after 15 years and a trillion dollars that the Afghan, it's time for them to take over their country. Senator Paul, you and I have talked about this many times. You know the instincts in Washington are to spend. You know that's what's going to happen. And yet you voted for the tax cut, which is contributing to these deficit and debt problems. How do you reconcile those two facts? I think if you're for tax cuts and for increasing spending, that's hypocritical. But if you're for tax cuts and you're also for cutting spending a corresponding amount, see, I would offset the tax cuts with spending cuts. And there are a few of us that would actually do that. When we had the budget deal that lowered the taxes, I also had an amendment to uh, look at and try to control entitlement spending at the same time to pay for the tax cuts. But interestingly, I could only interest three other Republicans. We had four votes total to try to control entitlement spending, and that is where the money is. And that's sort of and my so point, when, Senator, because you know where the votes are. You know the votes are there for tax cuts. You know they're not there for spending cuts. So isn't there any part of your voting pattern that is irresponsible? I don't think so, because, you know, I can only control how I vote. So I voted for the tax cuts, and I voted for spending cuts. The people who voted for tax cuts and spending increases, I think there is some hypocrisy there, and it shows they're not serious about the debt. But all throughout my career, I've always voted for spending cuts, and I'm happy to offset uh, cuts in taxes with cuts in spending. So, no, I think that uh, I've had a consistent position and been very concerned about the debt, and I want to shrink the size of government. So the reason I'm for tax cuts is I want to return more of the money to the people who own that, who, who, who actually deserve to have their money returned to them, but it also shrinks the size of government by cutting taxes or Se should if you'll cut spending at the same time. Senator Paul, I don't need to tell you this was a rough week in terms of White House personnel. Do you think the president was well served this past week by his chief of staff, John Kelly? You know, I don't know the ins and outs of who hires and fires and who goes through personnel files, but uh, 
you know, all I can say is from looking from the outside in and not really knowing all of the facts that obviously domestic violence should be roundly condemned, particularly in an advanced world like ours. That's just something that we shouldn't countenance. Is that a message you think this White House has communicated clearly? You know, I don't know. I just don't know the ins and outs. And I was kind of distracted for about, you know, 24 hours of that news cycle, you know, talking for long periods of time about sure. the deficit. And so, and it's hard for me, and I know the media gets consumed with this, you know, but it is sort of a personnel thing that those of us on the outside don't know the ins and outs. And I know everybody wants to speculate on it. Sure. But I think really that we should all roundly condemn domestic violence and then the, well, look, the complicated look, look. matters that really they have to deal with because they know all the facts and we don't. Sure, you know. but setting aside the ins and outs, uh, the president said on Twitter, due process, lives are being ruined. The vice president said, no tolerance. Can you reconcile yeah. those two? And if someone in Kentucky asked you, Senator, what's their position on this? Could you explain it to right. them? You know, it's difficult for me to get involved in theirs other than to say that absolutely no place for domestic violence in our world. And then beyond that, I will say that it, it, there is complicated things and somebody has to, I mean, if you've ever been to family court with he said and she said, and I'm not saying that I'm denying what these women are saying, I'm just saying that these things are very, very complicated. If you go to family court and you're a family court judge, you talk about a very, very difficult job. Um, but that being said, I don't want to think, I'm not, I don't want anybody to believe I'm making excuses. There is no excuse for domestic violence.